So our next presenters are presenting together. Glenn Brown is Executive Director of Local Government Infrastructure and Finance, Ministry of Community and Rural Development, and he is... Oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> Marina and Fun is Director of Engineering and Transportation, District of West Vancouver. They're presenting together. Please help me welcome them. This could get interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks and I uh, appreciate the opportunity of being here. Before we start, I think uh, I, I would like to identify that we're actually wearing two hats. I mean, Ray's with West Vancouver, I'm with the Ministry of Community and Rural Development, but we're actually also here representing the Water Sustainability Committee. Uh, I'm the chair of the committee, Ray's the past chair of the committee, uh, and the Water Sustainability Committee is a committee of the BC Water and Waste Association, and for the most part, that committee has been the driver for this uh, initiative. And so it's, it's with probably both hats that we're here presenting, uh, but I just wanted to sort of identify that for you. Um, before I start, uh, before we start talking about beyond the guidebook, we've got to talk about the guidebook, so I do have my prop. This is the tool. So this is uh, a, a guidebook for British Columbia stormwater planning. So developed in 2002. I'm not sure you should be familiar with this. If you're not, I certainly hope your planning and engineering departments are familiar with this. Uh, but anyway, this is the tool. Uh, we're really not going to be talking about the tool, um, and, and there's others, the water balance model is an on uh, a web-based tool as well. We're not going to be talking about the tool, but we're actually going to talk about the implementation um, of stormwater uh, management in BC. So. Uh, so beyond the guidebook is really about the stories of implementation of stormwater, uh, and really about the approach. And the approach is really about collaboration, partnerships, and alignment uh, of some uh, of goals of provincial government, local government, uh, and, and the community. And so that's really what we're talking about here today. So in keeping with the uh, theme of uh, the session in the conference, we really wanted to talk about the spirit of cooperation and collaboration to move our communities uh, forward and through specific actions. So the context for our presentation this morning is in the area of uh, water management, uh, water sustainability, green infrastructure, and uh, we wanted to take a look at how to change practices uh, on the ground uh, in our urban environments. And uh, Mike Harcourt says that uh, a lot of the change that we see is the sum <coughs> of uh, individual actions that we take uh, as, as it is very, very important. And so, about uh, beyond the guidebook 2010, uh, I talked about the tools. Uh, so the tools are the stormwater planning guidebook, uh, the water balance model. Uh, really the guidebook set the stage of a new way of doing stormwater management or rainwater management in BC. Talked about innovation, it talked about best management practices. Uh, the water balance model, one of the other tools that we're supporting is really a how-to in linking land use and water. Um, but uh, you know, one thing to keep in consideration here, stormwater management is not legislated in BC. Um, and, and so our approach has been through education and encouraging and supporting you know, the early adopters and the innovators and the leaders in local government in particular, uh, and really uh, developing the stories uh, that go into Beyond the Guidebook and using those stories as a way to promote and educate and build capacity in local government. Uh, so, you know, underpinning the guidebook, uh, underpinning beyond the guidebook, underpinning our approach ha has always been uh, a focus on the education. And, and with that education, the really important thing to consider is linking land and water. So it's not water on its own, <coughs> but it's really, you know, how our land use decisions impact our water resources as a whole. Again, isn't it? Disintegrated uh, presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it has my name on it. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I mentioned the importance of alignment. And when I talk about alignment, 
Uh, you know, I talk about alignment uh, in my ministry role quite a bit, and I talk about alignment uh, in the role I have with the Water Sustainability Committee as well. But it's really looking at, you know, some of the provincial goals and mandates. Uh, you know, we've heard about the Living Water Smart uh, strategy, and, you know, and that's certainly something that we're certainly promoting. Uh, you know, within my ministry, we have the Green Communities Initiative, which is really a looking at both land use development and, 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 and green choices for land use. Uh, looking at uh, some of the things within the guide itself and looking at some of the local government priorities. And when you actually have alignment, when those priorities and those mandates are in a line, uh, you know, that's where you really, that's where you really have the action on the ground. And that's what we're really focusing on. So using this provincial policy framework uh, as an umbrella, uh, a number of uh, on the ground initiatives um, were developed and we put this together and we called it the Water Sustainability Action Plan for BC. And this was to advance a, a water-centric uh, approach to how we develop our communities, how we develop the land. Um, this next slide was, uh, w when we take a look at water sustainability, um, uh, a friend of ours, Eric Carlson from Royal Roads University, helped us develop this approach for uh, taking a look at uh, water issues. Um, it's, it's very simple. It's just what, so what, now what, then what. And uh, really, it could be applied to any sort of issue. Uh, essentially, it goes like this. Uh, what? what? What is the issue here? Okay? And uh, then, so what? Like, what's, what's the significance? Um, okay, and now after we understand that, now what? Uh, what? What can we do? And then if we do these things, well, then what? Uh, what might happen? So as applied to um, water sustainability, um, you know, the issue <coughs> is uh, the form of the land development and how um, water is impacted through land development activities. Um, and, and so what? what? What's the significance? Well, what we need to do is that we need to influence practitioners uh, with respect to uh, helping them design uh, more in keeping with nature uh, through their, their development practices. And so we grouped these activities together and uh, we implemented what we call the Water Sustainability Action Plan for BC. And then so what? Uh, or I mean, then what? If we should have successes, we can uh, tweak that approach to methodologies and then we can actually then uh, look at replicating it in, in other communities. And so by developing uh, products and tools and supporting practitioners through a network, um, through outreach and, and education, um, training, partnering, uh, we can build capacities uh, within uh, local government. And so this has um, evolved into a comprehensive provincial program called Convening for Action in British Columbia. Uh, What's, what's important to note is that this approach is, is bottom up. It's, it's influencing practitioners and stakeholders. And as Glenn had sort of said, in, in BC, uh, with respect to stormwater management, it's not regulatory. And so we've built it very, very much uh, bottom up. So let's take a, an example of topsoil. One of the things that the research has found is that with um, a minimum of one foot or 300 millimeters of topsoil, it seems to make a real, real difference in terms of how uh, water is used and, and how water runs off the land. So that, when we uh, develop our land currently, a lot of the times our land development practices is <coughs> we strip off all the topsoil, we go and throw in subdivisions and that sort of thing. If we can find a way of reconstituting one, a minimum of one foot of topsoil, what that topsoil does is it acts as a sponge. And it retains moisture, and, and I'm connected to the uh, drought side. It means that um, uh, landscapes and, and vegetation uh, don't have to be irrigated as much, and therefore, it works towards water conservation and, and conserving the supply. At the same time, that layer of topsoil can act as a sponge, so when it does rain, what happens is that it sheds off the land uh, in a slower period of time because it gets retained in the topsoil and therefore reduces the amount of runoff that uh, adversely affects our, our uh, fisheries habitat and in our streams. 
Prior to the guidebook, uh, a lot of stormwater management was really only looking at the extreme storms. And it was primarily con uh, considered um, how to protect private property, how to avoid uh, flooding. And uh, what the guidebook did was to suggest that perhaps what we needed to do was to take a look at the entire spectrum of rainfall uh, from the small storms all the way to the large storms. Going beyond the guidebook means that we need to engage local governments and practitioners uh, with tools and training so that we can actually influence what gets built out in the field. And it's all about building a coalition to influence practice. All right, so, uh, you know, the philosophy behind the action plan is quite simple. I mean, it, it, it's bring, bringing local and regional stakeholders together where there's desire and an energy to make some form of change. And I, I guess the, the one thing I didn't talk about uh, or mention about the Water Sustainability Committee and really why the Water Sustainability Committee probably is a good fit for driving this forward. I mean, the Water Sustainability Committee uh, is a really diverse group. I mean, their focus is collaboration, partnerships, and alignment. Uh, we've got federal government uh, participation, provincial government presentations, lots of local government participation. We have private industry. We have academia. Uh, you know, so it's it, it's really a good holistic approach. Um, but as we move forward with the action plan, it's analogous to that. It, it's making sure that we brought the stakeholders together um, and providing them. Uh, and for, it's particularly providing the people on the ground in that particular community or region the tools and resources that they need to help support action at the local level. So uh, the regional team approach is, is a term that's been coined uh, as we move forward. Um, now, er Eric Bonham is a long-term public servant uh, who's now retired. Uh, now he's only working uh, 70 hours a week in his retirement. Uh, a mentor of mine, if you've been coming to UBCMs for a number of years, uh, he would be in the past uh, doing the same role I have uh, uh, doing now. Uh, but, you know, he's, he's heavily involved with the action plan and, and one of the things that he really understands is that, you know, a top-down approach doesn't work. Uh, really, it's all about a bottom-up. Um, and, and, you know, you know, I guess our approach has been, uh, the regional team approach has been, is when you know a community showed interest or desire to move something forward. That's when we've sort of mobilized, uh, and the action plan, uh, and its purpose is to engage, listen, understand, and support you know the local interests in moving forward. And that's where we've really, uh, I think, been successful. Uh, you know, so here are some examples uh, of where we've sort of uh, been working on the ground. Uh, 2008, we've had Vancouver Island Learning Lunch Series, which has just been a two-hour series over lunch. Uh, we've got local people, local stakeholders coming together and, and talking about an issue, facilitated discussions, uh, really uh, great communication opportunities and, and capacity building. Um, you know, there's a list of a number of them. I mean, the one thing, the, the one area that uh, I've certainly been involved in, and I'm not sure if anyone's here from the Comox Valley, but uh, there's been a lot of active uh, participation in the Comox Valley and, and really seen some benefits, uh, you know, really through developing some of the partnerships and collaborations that have occurred through Comox Valley and member municipalities. I mean, what we're seeing right now is, you know, planners and engineers are coming together. They've actually developed a framework called CV Ops. Uh, so the operations sort of network uh, within the uh, regional district coming together to make sure they're having communications and, and understanding whether that's uh, subdivision servicing standard bylaws and, and understanding how one community impacts the other, land use planning decisions, all that sort of thing. So, uh, you know, really seeing some of the work that's being done at a local level uh, really paying dividends in the long term. So when we've undertaken this regional team approach, what's emerged are, are, are these sort of uh, four, four, four sort of uh, principles. Um, first of all, we seek a common vision. And, and actually, I think um, I would reverse these, uh, these bullets. Um, we seek a common vision so that we can focus on the relationship between land and water. 
And then when we do that, we create uh, learning and networking opportunities for people. And then we promote the sharing of ideas and experience in order to influence uh, practitioner behavior. So an example of this, uh, in May 2005, in the Lower Mainland, we went and convened a group of engineers together. And we, when we had this, uh, this, this committee together and we're looking at the activities, we were thinking, well, maybe what we need to do is to create a, a design guideline uh, or a design manual, a green infrastructure design manual. And then that could be the tool that, uh, that people would need in order to change what happens. What we actually found from people when we got these, this group together was that, um, especially for the people who are trying to do innovative projects, that they told us it's really lonely uh, being a champion, especially in local government. And what they find is that no one actually really talks to one another. And uh, I don't talk to my counterpart in the next jurisdiction over, and that person doesn't talk to uh, the next person. And uh, everyone is so busy in the local government that we're doing these projects off the corners of our desks. And so what this group said that was that if you produced another manual, there would be a binder that would just be stuck on the shelf and they wouldn't use it. And then they, instead they said, you know what we need to do? We need to all get together. We need to pool our resources. We need to go out into the field. And so that's what we did. And so we brought together a group of engineers from a number of municipalities and we called it showcasing innovation, celebrating green infrastructure. And we got out in the field and people were able to take a look at projects like rain gardens and, and ponds and infiltration uh, trenches and things like that. And then, for, when we were all huddled outside in the field, then the questions started coming to sort of say, well, how do you deal with this problem? How do you design that? What, what, what about this environment? And then that was the way that we kind of promoted uh, the learning. And. Um, that, that type of approach has been rep replicated uh, from the Lower Mainland uh, to uh, Vancouver Island and in other jurisdictions. And um, it's a real example of this uh, sort of a, a convening for action approach. And so the convening for action moniker, it, it really started uh, or began in 2005 with some of the work uh, that uh, we were doing actually, members of the Water Sustainability Committee were doing as individuals and as a committee in the, in the South Okanagan, the town of Oliver, and uh, doing some work with the development of the regional growth strategy for uh, Okanagan and Um But you know what what we did was we we, we ultimately tested a different approach. Uh, you know, so the approach was to go out there and uh, you know have conversations and listen to people. Um, and, and so sort of through a lot of the work that uh, Kim Stevens <coughs> did here, and he's the gentleman that uh, really tells us what to do all the time when it comes to the Water Sustainability Committee and the heart and soul of the Water Sustainability Committee. He went out and, and he, had a lot, he had a series of interviews. So he interviewed the elected officials and he interviewed staff uh, and he developed stories. And uh, it was the sharing of the stories that uh, 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 was felt that uh, was adding value. So. You know, we, we learned some lessons in, in, in 2005, and it uh, certainly helped uh, adapt our approach as we were moving forward. And so as we're moving forward, we've got the meeting for action in George Basin. And, uh, you, you know, the one thing, that, a value that we've really seen, and Ray's already mentioned it, is, is the sharing. Uh, you know, no one talks to each other. And, you know, so how do you facilitate that communication? And that's what the Meeting for Action has done. And you know, we've got uh, five different sort of regional centers here on, on, on the map. And really what's happened is we made sure that uh, there's participation by all five in every session. And so we sort of facilitated that kind of communication. And uh, it, it's, it's, really, uh, uh, it, it, it's really supported uh, moving forward for a lot of local government. So this is a sort of a 10-point summary of what Convening for Action is all about. First of all, we in local government have to choose to be enabled. And, and I, I come from local government and I have to say that a lot of times we like to blame uh, or, or put on senior governments uh, the responsibility of saying, hey, they have a project framework for doing this or they, you know, they've created the problem. But you know, there are things that local government can do. So we need to choose to be enabled. Uh, set a high expectation for performance and what, what we want to see out of our, our subdivisions and our land development. 
embrace a shared uh, vision with each other, and then collaborate, collaborate as a regional team uh, so that we can align and integrate efforts. And, and then when we see things that happen on the ground, celebrate it, celebrate these uh, successes and innovations. Connect with one another through the community advocates like stream keeper groups and, and, and other uh, notables in your community. And then all this is designed to try and increase the capacity of our local government staff. Uh, promote this sense of shared uh, responsibility uh, and then the result then is a changed ethic uh, for the better uh, in how we treat our land. And, and if I just go back to the shared responsibility, what we mean by that is that everyone has a role and everyone can act. Uh, all levels of government, uh, developers, regulators, uh, bureaucrats, consultants, planners, engineers, we all have a role. Just, uh, just very quickly, one other way of, of kind, uh, trying to um, uh, illustrate this, uh, this is a slide that was uh, developed by uh, Bill Gary, adapted by him from 1999. What we find is that these uh, bubbles can be um, looked at in a number of different ways. Starting from the bubbles on the uh, left-hand side, we find that if you increase and provide education, that you'll get more participation from people, which then leads to a sharing of uh, achievable goals. When you have education, you increase people's understanding. When you have participation, people take ownership. When you have shared uh, achievable goals, you see action and, and you see things implemented. And then finally, the same is true on the right-hand side. When you have understanding, you, people do take ownership, and, and that leads to a call for action. We're just at the end here. All right. And, and just to finish, uh, you know, here's just a couple of the events that are slated for October. Uh, they're in an area uh, near you by all means to consider uh, participating. Um, and, and I guess on a final note, uh, you know, I mean, by all means, if there's interest, I mean, it can come to a neighborhood near you. Uh, but uh, ultimately, you know, the shared responsibility provides for the shared success. And, and really what we've seen is everybody wins, including our water resources. So. That's it for us and thank you very much.